Once my clothes were shabby, tailors called me cabby. So I took a vow and said, This bone will be no trouble. Now I'm smooth and snappy. Now my tailor's happy. shows um gypsy uh he wrote that with steven sondheim and uh that's probably the only song tonight that i could tell you a theatrical story about i was cast in that role uh just a short time after i had given up acting and gone into music i, I turned it down uh but it was tempting because that, that's a fun role to do uh with the tap dancing and so forth um anyway this is uh, his first big hit. And the funny thing about this song is uh, he was kind of, as time went on in his career, being pushed into songwriting. And he didn't even write the music for this song. He wrote the lyrics for this. This was back in 1926. And it sold 500,000 sheets. Because a lot of times in those days you judged the song by how many pieces of sheet music it sold. It was a whole thriving business. They would have sheet music pluggers in the Woolworths to help sell the song. Anyway, pay attention to the lyrics and tell me if it reminds you a little bit of Manic Monday by Prince. What am I to do? And then this third 
an interesting song, and you do kind of hear lyrical similarities. I'd like to think that Prince uh, borrowed at least the idea. Uh, very different, that song. And he wrote that for the Bangles. I think he used a pseudonym. It's not written as Prince, but that is his song. Um, Julie Simon was so many great songs. He wrote about 1,500. And his career spanned as a songwriter, I guess, from 1926 to uh, the early 90s. His last show, I believe, was The Red Shoes, which was not successful. That's a shame. That's a great story. And I would have thought that he could have brought something to it. But this is from something that was successful. to a futures contract and by the time they finally got to um, produce the show she had already kind of made it as a recording artist uh, it's just kind of interesting how things come together um, let's do two wartime songs one of them uh, he wrote with the great Frank Lesser this is when Frank Lesser was still writing just the lyrics and um, Funny story about this. After he wrote it, over in Berlin came to see him to tell him how much he loved the first of these two songs. The second one, which is also a quintessential World War II song, has had kind of a second life uh, as a song that Marvel Pictures used as the love theme for uh, Steve Rogers and Peggy Carter. I'm sure you'll recognize. That. Oh, mm -hmm. 
successful songwriter. His career had started out uh, as a child prodigy concert pianist when his parents emigrated uh, from Great Britain uh, and settled in Chicago. Um, and he started working as a pianist in bands like the Ben Pollock Band in Chicago, which was a pretty big outfit in the day. Uh, lots of great musicians went through that. Um, and then he made his way up to Hollywood, where he was working as a vocal coach. Um, and he was encouraged uh, that he should really be writing. I guess they heard some of his material that he had already written to date. And um, they said, well, that's where the money is, that's where the permanence is. Um, but he had already been vocal coaching people like Alice Faye and Shirley Temple. But probably his biggest break in terms of getting to the forefront of the industry was when he started being uh, Frank Sinatra's primary songwriter in the 40s. Uh, Sinatra, in fact, actively campaigned for him to be on uh, a couple of the films he did for RKO and MGM. Um, and uh, lots of great songs there. Uh, some of these I may have done in the Sinatra thing, but I'm willing to bet you a lot of them I have because I mainly kept them to ones he wrote in the 40s specifically for Frank or that Frank had the big hit. Uh, this is one of the big hits. Thank you. 
that was a hit for him in the 40s. He re-recorded it with Billy May in the 50s. It was a, a regular part of his repertoire. Um, I mentioned uh, MGM. He really had to push to get two guys that were relatively unknown to do this with him. And uh, it, it's such a wonderful score. It might be uh, my favorite early Sinatra movie. Um, just some beautiful singing. Uh, and this is uh, one of the uh, beautiful songs that was written. Uh, I've recorded this for an album called I Remember Frankie, which is kind of a tribute to stuff that was written for him in that Columbia period. Because uh, at that point, he probably recorded more than half of his output prior to Capitol, and there's just so much wonderful material. And uh, this is one of those songs that was written originally for Anchors Away. Jerry the Mouse. That's one of my favorite scenes. Uh, I showed it to my daughter in the last year, Ella, and uh, she uh, she loved it so much she literally had me play it again and again about five or six times in a row. Um, it's it's quite a number, um, and uh, it, it's it's a beautiful beautiful movie. Catherine Grayson, as well, was in that. Jose Iturbi, for those of you that are classical music fans of, of that era. This is uh, um, one of the other songs that was written, and it was set in that club uh, that he's in where um, Catherine Grayson sings Jealousy. Oh, boy. 
being a little uh, funky with me tonight. You see, this was the week we turned off the air conditioner and we have a, a wonderful house fan, which cools the house. It's not on at the moment for sound purposes, but during that transition, the piano gets slightly soggy because I have a window right here uh, and uh, I'm having to work a little harder with it. It's giving my hands a workout. Uh, this is another one of those great songs from, from the era. Now this did become part of Frank's repertoire um, and uh, it's, it's such a cute song, uh, fairly innocent. Day when the singing seemed to go so awfully fast We had so much fun and now you're home at last I look forward to a kiss up to at the garden gate But you gave me just one thing and insisted it was late But give me five minutes more Hi, Jenny. Hi, Christine. How are you? Thank you, Christine. That's very kind of you to say. Anyway, uh, this, is, uh, this is another one from Anchors Away. This is probably the, uh, the biggest standard from that. In fact, I'm quite sure. Uh, probably it is. Um, it's been recorded by many jazz uh, musicians and uh, cabaret artists. The thing that's funny is it's so short, you don't realize how short the song is. Um, it, the chorus of the song is only 16 bars. Perfect for an audition piece for musicals, I suppose. Um, and the story is that when Khan and Stein were writing it, they finished it, and they looked at it and said, boy, it's really short, and they just felt, but if we write any more, we're only writing for the sake of writing. We're not writing because we need to tell the story more, it's, it's complete in and of itself. And uh, they were right, it works perfectly well. There are those who believe love or take it. Love to them is just what they make it. I wish that I were the same. I fall in love to turn 
just left there alone on stage and sings and plays that. Uh, of course, I never understood how they got all the uh, strings there when they all left. Uh, I guess it was just the residual energy. So, um, this is going to be one of those songs where it's out of season here, but not out of season uh, south of the equator. I, I was thinking of this while preparing uh, this uh, songbook. Um, this is some people call it a Christmas song. It's not a Christmas song. It is a winter song. And, um, and it's a song uh, that is still a standard. Um, Julie Sine wrote two that would fall into this category, as well as Sandy Cohn, his compatriot at the time. And uh, at this time of year, you could probably still go down to uh, South America and hear it. Not necessarily in English, mind you, but it's winter down there. So, hope you like it. This is um, another Stein and Sammy Kahn song. It was written for another MGM movie called It Happened in Brooklyn, which I always find ironic that they had him playing guys from Brooklyn so much, even though he was from North Jersey. But, uh, this one starred him, Jimmy Durante, Catherine Grayson, who they seem to pair him with a good amount of time. As well as Peter Lawford. Wishes and hopes are the tiny ropes to which we attach our dreams. Tie up a few, and I'm certain that you will begin to achieve your dreams.
cute movie. Um, so that's just to give you a taste of some of the stuff that he was writing for Sinatra, and a lot of it was landing uh, as hits for him. Uh, and uh, he recorded all of them. Uh, I think, with the exception of What Makes the Sunset, I think he recorded all of them at one time or other more than once. Um, what Makes the Sunset only for the uh, movie, as far as I know. Uh, I believe he did a nice version with Nelson Riddle in the late 50s. Um, so now we're back to some of the Broadway stuff. And this is a song I first heard because my mom was a gigantic Johnny Mathis fan. And so I remember his version of this. So I was quite taken by surprise when I saw that it had been in the musical Gypsy. I could be mistaken. 
um, but he brought him in uh, along with Compton and Green to write some additional songs uh, to flesh out the score. And uh, the show starred Mary Martin. Uh, she was flying in it, so I think you can figure out what it was. And this is a, this is a great song. I do it a little differently um, with your indulgence. Uh, I hope you like it, what I've done with it. saw that was on um, TV, it, was, it, it got a lot of bad reviews at the time, but I gotta say, I, I enjoyed it. It was, uh, it was cute. It was cute. Um, this is uh, another Con Stein song. Uh, this was a hit in 1942. It, the hit was for Harry James, I want to say Kitty Kalin uh, sang it. I could be mistaken with that. It came in second place for the Oscars. The, sh the song that beat it was White Christmas. I think we agree that they chose the right song, but this is a pretty darn good song in its own right. Frank eventually recorded this uh, for Columbia, and he also got to it with Capitol. It's become a standard, and it's the title song for tonight's live stream. <laughs>
right song, but if you notice, that opening progression melodically and harmonically is reminiscent of a another song he wrote. Um, just saying, if you're if you're going to steal, you may as well steal from something good. And if you're stealing from yourself, it's not really stealing, is it? Um, so uh, this is a. Uh, one of his classics, and it's a signature song. I, I generally try to stay away from signature songs, but some of these songs are, are very difficult to stay away from because they're just such good songs and such wonderful representations of his work. Um, this was written for a uh, funny girl. Um, they wanted to cut it. Uh, you'll hear so many stories in the history of songs that were supposed to be cut. Uh, Over the Rainbow was supposed to be cut, for example. and. Um, and uh, Julie Stein pleaded and pleaded and said, no, that song is going to make me a lot of money. And it did. very 
it's funny. Um, earlier uh, this week, uh, on a Facebook post, uh, Joey DeMarco, uh, who also knows my sister, we both worked with him at Mount St. Joseph's when we did some shows there. Joey was affiliated with Mount for years um, as a performer, as a choreographer, as a director, as a teacher, etc. You, you name it, he did the whole shebang. And uh, he mentioned uh, something that brought up my mom, uh, and my sister uh, tagged me on it and uh, mentioned some of the songs she used to sing. And that, I, I don't know if I mentioned that, but that was definitely a song used, she used to sing. I still have the sheet music with my father's violin obligato handwritten out that he would uh, play. She used to love to sing um, uh, songs like that, songs like The Sound of Music. She loved anything that uh, pretty much Streisand or Julie Andrews uh, ever did. And, uh, you know, she was a phenomenal, phenomenal singer. It just came out of her heart in a way that very few people can ever uh, replicate. So, anyway, um, my, my mom, uh, and I miss her so much, but uh, she used to say that when I sang jazz, it made her nervous. And I'd say, why? She said, because I don't know what you're going to do. And I would say, well, that makes two of us. That didn't make her less nervous. Uh, uh, so this is, a, this is a song that was from a show produced by David Merrick. And there's a, a great story to the show. The show was called Subways Are For Sleeping, which was about the homeless problem. It was based on an article written in the mid-50s. So obviously, this is not a, a new issue we're dealing with. And uh, the critics really didn't like it. So Merrick had the idea, he looked up in the New York phone book of people with the exact same names as the famous critics of the day, had them go to the show, got quotes from them, and made it seem like they were the critics giving it rave reviews. Uh, quite clever. Um, and uh, this, this became a, a staple for people like Tony Bennett and uh, Judy Garland, late in Judy's career, because this is from uh, 1967? Oh, I'm sorry, 61. Anyway, here it goes. frustrated with the score that one night he snuck into the pit and stole all of the parts. Uh, that's uh, That really is dedication to not liking something, that you gather up 20 pieces or more of books and steal them 
Uh, I guess he owned them. He was the producer, but nonetheless. Um, so this is another one of those big numbers. It's a signature number, um, but I'm going to do it very differently. People, you know, there's nothing really else you can do with it. This one, I, I kind of see the, the song differently at, at this point in my life. Um, I hope you like what I've done with it. Um, really haven't changed it much, just taken it down about 200 decibels from Ethel Merman and uh, changed the tempo quite a bit. this song earlier um, as something that was a little familiar. It was originally from the show uh, Bells Are Ringing. And, and talk about um, uh, a show that is, uh, is anachronistic. I mean, I, I guess I'm old enough to remember that when I was in New York uh, as an actor that you need to have service. But our services were just recorded, and you would, call, you would give that number, oh, someone's at the door, you would give that number to uh, audition folk, and they would call Thunder McDog. Relax. He's crazy. Oh, you can let him. And they would call for that number, and you would check the machine, you know. Um, and you had to make sure you had a two-on-two area code because they wouldn't take it seriously if you did. Nowadays, it doesn't matter because people have cell phones from all over. Um, but in that day and age, you did. So this was from the era where people would call in to a service, but it was actually a live person that would take the messages and you would call into that person. So uh, the romantic interest was from a guy who would call into the service and he fell in love with the girl that answered the phones for him as well as many other people. She wasn't just his service. Um, and uh, I have it 
joined with another song I did this arrangement. Uh, and the other show is Do Re Mi. And this is also anachronistic. It was a, that was a show that starred Phil Silvers and um, Nancy Walker, uh, who uh, was a great, great belter from back in the day. And that was about song pluggers. Um, and again, those things just don't exist. It's an anachronistic uh, industry and part of the industry. So I hope you like these. I was resting comfortably face down in the gutter. Life was serene. I knew where I was at. There's no hope for me, my dearest friends would mutter. Straight ahead, bebop, a lot of vocalies. If you're a John Hendricks fan, this is the one for you. Uh, this is a mix of some swing and ballads, some offbeat standards. If you if you like Jimmy Bruno, he's on uh, several cuts of this and sounds absolutely wonderful. Um, if you like what I do with rock tunes, uh, this was the first full length album I did of derangements, and it's deranging the doors, the rock band, the doors. 
uh, with some wonderful musicians. Um, if you like saloon songs and a, a mood album, that's what this is. Very sad. Uh, I did it with Jason Long way back in the day. And this is my most recent cut. This is uh, the arrangements of Billy Joel tunes, Billy Joel Project. Uh, I guarantee you're going to know almost every song on here except for one, uh, which was a deep cut and um, well worth uh, the purchase, in my opinion. Um, also, uh, the tip jar is open. I appreciate uh, whatever you can give. No amount is too small. No amount is too large either. I take all denominations, especially electronically. Um, and uh, it, it's appreciated. Believe it or not, it, it is a lot of work that I put in to uh, getting the music together, shedding them, and uh, even doing some research on the music. A lot of the stuff I know, but there's a lot of stuff I don't. And uh, I always like to check out stuff to have some really interesting stories and history because it's not just music or theater history, it's American history in uh, a great many circumstances. So I hope you like this. This is one of the last songs he wrote. Uh, Sinatra did record this on uh, his album, She Shot Me Down. And uh, it's a great song to close with.